So I've started the recording and uh, we'll wait for one more minute before we start. This was a uh, last minute sort of call to action uh, to have this to have this meeting and to uh, talk about uh, the things that we uh, discussed uh, in, in, in our email. So I think even though there are only five participants, we have to start now. And uh, like Mani said, this is a, uh, pretty slow weekend here in the United States, I mean week in the United States because of the Memorial Day weekend. And of course, uh, people are probably making up for their lost uh, time. Uh, so let's, let's go to it. A well, couple of things. One, uh, you know, we, we need to talk about two or three things uh, before we start. One is the fact that uh, that we are part of the Linux Foundation and we have to obey the antitrust policy of Linux Foundation. That's the first thing. The second is the fact that we treat each other with respect even when we are disagreeing with each other, even if we are disagreeing with each other. And that is the second aspect. Uh, so, uh, welcome, Alfonso. Um, since we uh, did not announce this uh, a long time, uh, you know, we we gave only a, a short notice. I have a feeling that we are going to be. Um, have less than ideal attendance, but we will uh, nevertheless go with this presentation, uh, which I'm going to start, but uh, let me introduce Kirti. Kirti is the vice chair of this group, and he's also a um, guy who's been very active, especially in the insurance uh, sphere, and he's working on a lot of things, most importantly, liquidity for certain um, types of securitized insurance linked uh, securities. So that's important to consider. Uh, so I lead off with a little uh, uh, look at the Ricardian, con the con concept of Ricardian contract, even though people do not uh, know, know about this, it's, it was started in 1996 um, and uh, Iran is here. So we have all the important people. Uh, I don't know about that, but thank you, Vipin, good to see you. <laughs> good to see you. So we are gonna discuss, uh, you know, the, the main thing we are going to do is take a very broad view uh, and then link it to specific uh, ideas in insurance linked securities, securitization, and then go from there to liquidity as a concept and uh, why that is important and what are the proxies of liquidity and how do you monitor them and how do you link it back to the initial issuer's contract? Uh, and how do we also automatically manage liquidity, which is of course the, uh, the failures that we have seen in the crypto market are linked to that uh, because liquidity disappearing is what causes tremendous price uh, movements. Uh, so I'll, I'll start off with the with a presentation uh, where I'm going to share the screen. 
um, let me let me go back to this and try to share the screen. Okay. And uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Uh, can you see the presentation or is it not visible? Presentation. Is the screen changing? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So first we go with recording contrast. Like I said, you know, this is the basic agenda and uh, we should be, there should be a fair bit of participation. Otherwise this is uh, quite uninteresting. Uh, first thing is what exactly is uh, a recording contract? Uh, it has been variously described as a software pattern and other things, but uh, basically it is a single document that is both human readable and mach machine parsable. Proposed in 1996, maybe 13 years before Bitcoin itself came online. So it has uh, some, uh, some history behind it. And the other aspect to it is that it is an immutable commitment. That means the document is, can be hashed and then it can be signed. And later on, it was discovered that it can be implemented by using a smart contract. But in the beginning, there was no blockchain, but it is meant to be an internet-based uh, issuer contract, which is how it started off. And the dispute res resolution uses the original contract. So the two aspects of it, that it is human readable and it's machine parsable at the same time, makes for a linkage between the world of us humans, the analog world and the digital world, which of course we have seen a tremendous explosion of uh, uh, ideas that, under, that are underpinned by something like this, even though we may not even call it uh, a, uh, Ricardian contract, we, we still would recognize the basic elements of this in almost all of the activities in the crypto sphere. But we have seen that not being aware of this gestalt, this, this story of the whole thing makes people not realize certain elements of it and hence causes problems in the market when stress hits. This is the main uh, story here. That is that any digital contract has its feet in both the human world and the digital world, even though people do not recognize that fact and they only recognize it when things start going bad. They are very happy when the prices are going up constantly, but when the prices take a hit, they are not happy. Um, anyway, so what are the, what are the uh, features? The hash creates a contract that cannot be changed. Um, the additional part of this is that the Ricardian, there's a Ricardian PKI that delivers clarity on the, so first thing is hash creates a contract that cannot be changed. We are, we are familiar with this concept in, uh, in um, ideas like CDM 
a CDM is actually a recording contract, strange enough, strangely enough, because you can actually generate the contract or at least uh, generate some form of contract from, from the original CDM, the uh, common domain model of, of ISDA. Uh, the other thing that is not commonly known is that the Ricardian PKI uh, contains, is a self-contained um, piece of data that is the public key of the issuer and of the signing key are in the initial contract. Uh, people may say, oh, you know, that, do, that doesn't make sense. You've got to have a trusted third party. You've got to have something else. But here the concept is that the key is known, well known through relationships, which are the basic fact of human interaction uh, makes the key uh, a reality. And the last point, which is the presumption of possession, the user has the contract. Otherwise, just knowing the hash doesn't make sense. This is not some kind of a blinded commitment. It is more of the fact that the user can say, okay, it, this is the contract. And if I hash it using the proper method, I will get the same hash as that in the contract. And uh, there is a presumption that the user possesses the, con or the original contract or at least has access to it, uh, which is not the case in many, many ICOs, many other things, because there is no contract. There is the ERC-20 uh, smart contract, but the issuer doesn't stand behind uh, you know, it in, a, in the same or similar way. Uh, so this is the seven layers uh, that started off the Ricardian contract. So it is recognized that you have cryptography at the basic, uh, basic at the base level, then software engineering, which is you know how do you send messages, how do you transport the uh, the actual goods, actual work, a product from one participant to another. And then the rights, in this case, the rights are nothing but a linkage to the identity. Then there is accounting, which if you look, if you know CDM, the accounting is things like how do you, you know, what are the promises the issuer has made and the events that, that impel the issuer to pay up according to certain events. And then of course the governance, uh, which is non-technical governance and which is basically what some people may call a type of crypto economics. And then you have exchange of value. And then from there on the final uh, layer, you have finance itself, which is nothing but the topic of our discussion here, capital markets. So it is a slowly emerging concept that finally ends up in finance. If any of these things are missing in the original contract, then you have difficulties, especially enforceability is a big, big problem. And you know how the contract takes care of that is important. So now we go to the uh, concept of securitization, which, be, which is very important because it is nothing but the issuer saying that, you know, this is a financial instrument that, I've, that I have created from a pool of assets. Normally the asset has generates cash flows and that's how the uh, the securitized instrument pays out. And of course, I'm not going to go into the details of the tranching mechanisms where, um, so some people have asked questions on the chat, uh, I, I think. Um, uh, 
accounting, does accounting um, have events? Accounting is basically caused by events that are promises to pay inside the uh, inside the contract that is sent out by the issuer. Uh, so what does it do, the securitization? I mean, this is only a specific form of um, um, a digital asset, which is a securitization. And th that's what we're going to discuss, especially Kirti is going to discuss uh, it creates fungibility from non-fungibility, which is a tremendous concept. Uh, people do not usually think about this, like a home loan is not a fungible asset, but by creating a pool of home loans and securitizing them, the mortgage-backed securities that it creates are fungible. In other words, each uh, unit uh, of the securitized assets is the same as others. And in fact, I have uh, proposed that as a way to securitize even uh, the so-called NFTs, which are artworks and so on. But uh, the problem with those assets is that they do not, uh, they do not generate cash flow. as a matter of fact. The only way that they generate value is through the rise of value. What happens if the value falls? Uh, all of these have to be handled in the issuer's um, contract, which they, you know, which takes us back to the Ricardian concept. And because it creates this uh, sort of fungibility from non-fungibility, it creates liquidity. That means people can buy little pieces. Uh, institutions can buy knowing that the prospectus of the issuer, which is a, another recording contract, is enforceable. Uh, currently, there is a lack of transparency, but again, going back to the recording contract, that can increase due to the uh, due to the fact that user possesses the contract and then can link the events, the accounting events, to whether they should get paid or not. So next uh, slide is going to be uh, where Kirti takes over and leads us through the ILS, Insurance Linked Securities, and he's, a, he's been investigating liquidity also. And, uh, and you can tell me whether you want me to uh, advance the screen, okay? Will do, thanks, thanks, Wipin. So, um, Wipin, you know, covered quite in detail about um, insurance linked securities. Uh, I wouldn't say insurance linked securities, sorry, about Ricardian contracts. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why I, I think insurance linked securities are, are really interesting is because uh, it creates that whole element of fungibility from non-fungibility. Now, what? why is it lucrative for both the parties? Like in this whole ecosystem, there are two parties. One is the issuer or the sponsor uh, of that specific uh, risk. It is uh, nothing but an insurance company. On the other side, you're looking at... Oh, uh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's okay. And on the other side, you're looking at the investor. Now, um, what is ILS doing? ILS is just helping you know, investors um, come in, take a part of the risk in, in return for a reward. And what does, how does that help the issuer or the sponsor? Is the sponsor has um, passed on uh, a part of his book. He has diversified the risk further into capital markets using uh, special transformer vehicles or structures. And this creates better diversification of risk over a period of time. So it creates a win-win for both the parties. Of course, they're very different complex structures um, which work in specific jurisdictions as well as in, in various regulatory environments. Well, we'll get into that a bit later. But 
uh, one of the most lucrative things for the investors, especially for the institutional investors, is it's got very little correlation to you know your traditional capital markets. Most of the um, events are triggered either through some some majority today, majority of um, ILS backed instruments are um, into something like cat bonds, sidecars, ILWs, et cetera. So we'll get a little more into the detail of that. Um, Bipin, move to the next slide. So this is what we spoke about. And um, while it looks very simple, the way the risk is transferred from the sponsor or the insurance company um, to a sedent or a protection buyer. So we have a first element of risk transfer from the sponsor to the insurer reinsurer to what is known as an insurance special purpose vehicle. And of course, through the insurance special purpose vehicle is how um, the capital market investors interact with this whole mechanism. Now, where do Ricardian contracts come into the picture uh, is um, we look at the part where there is an ISPV involved. Uh, what we've been traditionally trying to look at is to model the whole cat bond or an ILS instrument as a digital twin. Now, if anyone understands complex systems, a digital twin has two parts to it. One is the analog signals, as well as the other part is the digital signals that come into it. And, and how can we do that using the basic principles of um, Ricardian contracts is something that I will, I will talk about right now. Um, so in, in the, um, so what's of interest to us is to look at the ISPV structure as to how the structure in itself acts as a vehicle to transform risk and how does that happen? So every insurance or reinsurance contract um, is wrapped, it's got a fund wrapper around it. It could be either traded as a cat bond or it could be traded as um, a sidecar. So in the sidecar, you have like a specific fund which is created and, and when this is done, uh, what happens is um, you have uh, investors who are issued a prospectus. So generally this is um, um, institutional investors who are issued a prospectus. The prospectus has the terms and conditions under which um, it, it clearly describes what are the returns, what is the liquidity mechanism, uh, what is the proposed earnings uh, and, and things like that. So it, it, it's very, very comprehensive. Um, and the aspect of Ricardian contracts comes, comes into the picture again, because we want to look at it and decide for ourselves to say, hey, what part of this can be computable? And what part has to take like an analog signal to human intervention, perhaps governance? And, and how do we address that? Like, you know, when we create that digital twin and how do we take it forward from there? On? So uh, that is the basic principle of how we look at a digital twin and why the importance of digital twin is having a digital twin can create certain liquidity mechanisms and which can also be very, very compliant the way regulator wants to see it. Say for example, the regulator says that the, um, the, uh, the, it, so the uh, reserve capital, which is required by the insurer to be able to uh, right insurance, which sits today in this ISPV, is it has to be pre-funded, and the obligation or the intercontrovertibility of the contract is that the reinsurer has um, the rights of that reserve capital rather than the capital investor. So this is the trade-off where the capital market investor has taken on some risk onto his portfolio in return for a reward, which is nothing but a part of the premium, which is passed on to the capital markets investor, either as a, as a, as a coupon or an interest payment. So that is a simplified structure and, and um, moving on. So, so if we go back to this, um, to this uh, diagram, each one of those contracts can be modeled uh, using something that is both human readable and linked to something that is machine parsable, uh, usually using a uh, markup language, uh, which has been done through 
things like, you know, many, many people are active in this space. There have been a lot of uh, uh, like Lee Brain's uh, activities there that, uh, uh, you know, uh, people like, um, so, so one of the things pe people like, you know, the Corda, uh, Corda people have made this a important part of their, uh, of their um, whole uh, selling proposition because probably because uh, Ian Grigg was, who's the originator of the recording contract was one of the original uh, participants in, in Corda when he started, when he designed it. And I had talked to him extensively about this uh, stuff. Uh, the other part, which is kind of not shown here directly is that the collateral trust interacting with the capital market investor is also uh, predicated or dependent on a contract because the coupons and interests are uh, paid uh, according to a certain schedule, uh, looking at certain events. So uh, anything you wanna say there, Kirti? Like how does the capital investor know, okay, I have to, uh, you know, I am protected so I can invest in this. Hmm. So, um, the, so the, there is a lot of transparency within the prospectus, which talks about how um, the collateral trust invests most of the reserve capital, which is in there, into like high rate of short term investments. So that is clearly articulated. And, and that income, which comes from the investment, it also acts as sort of a buffer in case there is some sort of, a, uh, I would say, trigger event or some sort of, a, uh, I, I would say, claim which is coming through um, in, into the system. And um, of course, um, there's a lot of clarity on, on the promise to return both the collateral and if there is no trigger event, the prospects clearly articulates that there is the collateral as well as the, um, the coupon will be paid out um, as, as a part of the uh, closure of the ILS prospect. This is the happy path. So let's go back to the other slide, which talks about the benefits. Yeah. Uh, now let's concentrate on a little bit on what are the downsides? Because that's, mm. that's something that uh, people miss when they, especially when they are uh, selling the idea. And how yeah. does something like a recording contract protect you uh, during those uh, times of, you know, a downdraft? That's, that's important. Mm. Uh, do you have anything to say about that or? Um, well, um, when a, a risk event um, or a trigger event occurs, um, the, well, the fund prospectus covers most of the risk which is associated with these investments because most like 80% or I would say 60 to 80% of the market today is cap bonds, which is climate triggered events, right? Now these climate tri triggered events um, like Hurricane Katrina, and, and all of these, when if they trigger by any chance, which is very, very, you can, you can see that most of the stuff is parametric in nature uh, and which is a straight signal in, into um, the, the, um, the SPB where it has to pay out immediately. Um, when such things happen, um, the investor is, is clearly aware of the risk that is, is um, taking on to his portfolio. So- Or she. He, he or she, sorry. Uh, <laughs> they. Uh, he or she is taking it to the portfolio. And of course, um, there is always like every, um, every investment prospect, there's always a probability of losing both your capital as well as returns in, in, the, in the prospect. So that is something which is no different from any other financial instrument that exists in the market. Yeah, so um, 
do you want me to of go course, to the next? There are, sorry, yeah, of okay. course, there are certain buffer mechanisms which are built in. Like, for example, when I spoke about the, the collateral trust, the income from the collateral trust acts as a first level of buffer to um, take in any hit which comes into um, you know, the ISPB. And of course, there's, it's a contract of a contract. So at the first level, you have the sponsor treaty contract, treaty or a... Um, so this triggers from the sponsor side, which hits the reinsurer and the reinsurer goes into, from, from the reinsurer, it goes into ISPB from where the claim is, is paid out. So just wanted to articulate that. The, the income from the collateral trust not only pays for the whole uh, ISPV, but it also pays um, sometimes um, for the initial hit or a threshold within which it can manage specific trigger elements, beyond which then the, the, highly, the highly rated short-term investments are then liquidated to pay out. If it's a big, big trigger event, the, the highly rated, highly liquid, you know, um, uh, investments are then liquidated to pay out um, the rest of the trigger. So just wanted to highlight that as well. Yeah, so here we are um, dealing with um, a very specific form of securitization. We just wanted to, uh, we, we were going from, let's say a uh, 10,000 square, uh, 10,000 foot, 30,000 foot view to, you know, something very close, but all through we see that the contracts are the animating feature. It is contracts all the way down. Meaning exactly. uh, the contract between the Qual Trust and the capital market investor is backed by, is, is dependent on the counterparty contract between the reinsurer and the collateral trust and the reinsurer and the sponsor have a risk transfer contract. Of course, even the customers who actually come to the sponsor have already signed a contract for paying premiums um, in order to get that insurance. So contracts all the way down and Absolutely. how they link to each other. Huh? Absolutely, Ripon. And think about it as a complex system, right? So if you think about it in the terms of a Ricardian contract, there are commonality of elements which transfer the risk from you know, the actual customer to the actual capital investor. So there are elements of the contract which act as digital signals, which then become very, very computable over a period of time. And if, they, if the right type of data and the right type of structure is created, it creates almost a seamless payout structure. Like for example, there are certain parametric insurance covers that exist today. They, they pay out as soon as, a, as, a, as an event has occurred. And because they have certain sensors and, and they can always do, they always are aware from the models of risk version. And when a trigger event happens, they're very, very clearly at the heart of all the, the parametric information they get through. And the, the whole objective is not to make it a lot more complex. The objective is to kind of see how we can pick and choose elements which can be, um, I would say, um, automated, which can be uh, computed clearly, easily, uh, and focused on to create that specific liquidity and flow from customers to capital investors across the ecosystem. So that's the basic idea. Of course, it will have a lot of elements of governance, uh, which we may not be able to implement at this point in time, but probably in the future state we should, once we've modeled the aspect of the asset in, in, in a digital twin format. But governance in that sense, and also the whole crypto economics um, is an emergent quality, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, proceeds because of the base, the bases are covered uh, in the fact that, you know, you have the direct correlation between the human readable contract and the machine parsable contract. And uh, it, it all starts with us humans. So exactly. that's, that's very important. 
Yeah, and uh, and the fact that you cannot change the contract, the uh, power asymmetry. That means the investors have less lesser power than the collateral trust, uh, you know, managers and the reinsurers. But even though they have lesser power they are protected because of the fact that there is an immutable uh, contract which uh, can operate. And plus, you know, smart contracts have known to have bugs. So we can always go back to the, to the paper contract. So the, sure. everything is uh, codified in the paper contract. So if there are bugs, then they, they have to be fixed. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, it has to follow the contract, not, you know, the paper contract, not the uh, smart contract. Excellent. Uh, next slide is about uh, market liquidity uh, and how does this relate to the contract? Because as, as long as there's someone uh, assuring that there is a market maker, there's someone who says that I will be your counterparty in uh, most circumstances at a, for a reasonable price. Market liquidity refers to the ease in which an asset can be sold in a market at a reasonable price. So a reasonable price is the key point here, uh, which means that the price stability is important. Uh, if you can sell something at a fire sale price, it doesn't mean that the market is liquid. You can always give it away or you can even, uh, you know, this happened during the, during the whole financial crisis, 2008, 2009. And we have seen similar, uh, similar things happen even uh, last couple of weeks in the crypto market where buyers disappeared. So if there are no buyers and all there remains are sellers, there are no transactions and price discovery is impo impossible. And there were times even when bigger, big exchanges like Coinbase, you couldn't transact or Binance or whatever. So when the price is going down, especially, this uh, becomes a big problem unless the counterparty emerges that can do a support price. In, in regular capital markets, especially for the highly liquid instruments like treasuries, it happens to be the central banks mm -hmm. who have done it these days. And that's what supports the price of those bonds, even of corporates, even of junk bonds, even of, you know, all of the other stuff and people complain, but they don't realize that if that price, those prices go down like crazy, uh, then there are problems with the, with the market. Anyway, Dan, you are going to ask something? No, it's just uh, the point I was gonna make is that we have flash crashes even in treasuries. So yes. I think you're, you're establishing kind of two features of liquidity the ease of transaction and the ease of discovery of interest, which automation provides, and the interest to provide liquidity either side, which is related to the former, but isn't the same. Right, I would argue that, you know, whatever Bitcoin sliding, you know, by thousands of dollars in price was was still liquid from an instrument perspective. It just, there was, it was a one-sided market. Price discovery was, you know, maybe it was exaggerated, I don't know, but we'll have time will tell, but we, prices were discovered um, for a transaction without impedance by, wait, what is this, what is this asset that I'm buying? Which is, I think, you know, that was your former point, is that there isn't a question 
um, using your carbon or other smart contracts to express these kind of transactions, there isn't a question about what it is, which, can, which is a huge barrier to finding liquidity. Well, I mean, you are saying that prices were discoverable, but uh, I would argue that point because if there are no transactions, if there are no buyers, the prices that you're discovering is of a one-off uh, transactions that are either wash transactions or somebody attempting to uh, prop it up with some, I mean, you know, not real uh, liquidity, meaning the amount of transactions and the block, you know, the size of the transaction are also important because, you know, you can have a straight transaction, like you said, the, the flash crash, if you're going to sell uh, treasuries automatically, and if uh, it causes negative feedback loops that the prices crash, uh, then, you know, all those transactions which people engaged in uh, end, ends up losing money for them, especially when the flash crash passes. Uh, the point about um, the recording contract is, I mean, recording contract is, you know, too much said, but the whole idea is that there is a uh, human and digital aspect to any uh, transaction. And most of the time you can let, let the uh, aut automation run, but we have to be also very, very clear about, uh, you know, certain other proxies of liquidity that is, you know, the size of the transactions, the number of those transactions and who's actually making them, you know, all those things are important. And of course, it's very difficult to find out who's actually making uh, some transactions in, in the crypto market. Yeah, I mean, look, at the end of the day, I suspect, I suspect that we're all um, closer in understanding and agreement that we are farther apart um, I think that it's a semantic or pedantic argument uh, with respect to Bitcoin. If it goes from gaps down from 40,000 to 30,000, price was discovered at 30,000, just not necessarily happy for those who were trying to sell. Um, mm -hmm. uh, volume decreased also, which is in interesting. But I mean, these are all market dynamic. Those, my point was really, those are, there's a part of liquidity that's market dynamics and there's a part of liquidity that comes from clear transparency about what it is that's being transacted. And the, the automation, smart contracts, recording contracts, as I understand them, which is limited, those are addressing the second point, the clarity about what it is that's being transacted, right? If it's, and I'll, so I'll give the example, if, you have a catastrophe bond linked to hurricanes, uh, and all of a sudden, we we you know the market perceives that hurricanes are going to be more. There are going to be more hurricanes, and they're going to be stronger. Then uh, those bonds are going to decrease in price because the risk is higher. That's appropriate. The good news is that people who are evaluating buying or selling know what it is they're transacting in because the contract has been described systematically. That's right. Um, I'm happy that you think that uh, people have, uh, people are um, sophisticated and are, <laughs> uh, but they, they always cry when they lose. Uh, of course. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's the whole, <laughs> uh, but again, coming back to recording contract, these uh, practices should shore up price stability. That, that, that's, that's all the, I mean, without looking at the whole picture and taking care of it in your issuance contract, uh, you are more subject to this wild swings than if you're not. Uh, that, that, that's all there is. I mean, it's not, it's not a question of, that they won't crash either. They, 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 you know, depending on the 
on what is happening in the real world, of course, there's no protection. And that is a whole argument. But having these protections should make uh, the bonds, you know, whatever it is, cheaper, the asset cheaper and uh, people more willing to transact in them. So going back to this uh, liquidity proxies, uh, some of the observe, observed uh, ideas are to uh, uh, look at the bid ask spread, the price volatility, number of number and size of transactions per period, um, and these are some of the proxies of liquidity that can be observed in the market. Uh, and. This also kind of brings us to an interesting point about um, um, automated market making, right? The AMM yes. aspect of, of things for ILS. Uh, so looking at it traditionally, um, secondary market for ILS is limited, complex, and of course liquidity generally is provided as, as a mechanism in the prospectus where you know the issuer generally says that every quarter we uh, give you a choice to buy back some of whatever, you know, the, the uh, ILS instruments that we have issued from you as an institutional customer. But um, the, the experiment where I'm trying to explore at this point in time is looking at uh, the possibility of a regulated capital pool um, where the interacting entities are known, like for example, institutional customers obviously known entities are looking at what is known as a, a bonding curve. Uh, a bonding curve is nothing but um, an algorithm which helps you assess um, liquidity for a specific asset based on um, a value, uh, a stable value that it's picked. So this, this is the area that we are absolutely exploring. And the liquidity proxies that you've highlighted as a part of this conversation, that is, the bid ask spread is addressed by the algorithm. The pricing volatility again is addressed by the algorithm. The number of transactions and period, uh, of course, the number of transactions, of course, is a very important element because uh, as the transactions increase, um, if there is a pair within an AMM pool and it's linked to a specific, um, what is called as a constant value curve, then there it, it creates uh, you know the, the whole aspect of price discovery in an automated way and um, gives you that um, uh, the liquidity as well as ability to look at arbitrage opportunities within the automated market market pool. So this is you know something that I just wanted to add to the conversation and and what we are trying to explore today um, in the lab. Um, you are exploring this in uh, your uh, interactions with the balancer protocol or uh, uh, something else, right? Yes, it's, uh, it's a part of the exploration with balancer protocol. And um, if it was easy, it would have been done already, but because there's a whole- Not, element... true, not always <laughs> true, but- <laughs> uh, But there is a whole element of, you know, uh, regulation which comes into place as to how we can put certain uh, circuit breaker mechanisms, um, also the ability to trade between certain um, part of the bonding curve, not the entire spec of the bonding curve. And of course, um, also um, certain risk mitigation mechanisms that we need to put in place are all of the things that we are trying to discover. Again, it goes back to the whole aspect of the guardian contracts, the way, the objective way of looking at everything is a complex system, which has got many inputs, assessing these inputs either as uh, analog, that is where we step in to provide some sort of an input, and digital, which is uh, possibly generated automatically as a part of the process, either through an oracle or, or, or um, perhaps through um, um, the algorithm in itself. So now Mani has you, raised his hand. Uh, if you want to let him sure. ask the question. Um, Kitty, this is a, how is this uh, 
how is the balance of protocol different from, let's say, the Uniswap version three, where it mm -hmm. allows you to put uh, liquidity in certain parts of the yield uh, of the of the curve? Maybe if you can explain. Um, bal balancer has got now balancers in version two, uh, and they are currently uh, looking at implementing some sort of a mechanism called as an asset manager. And the asset manager kind of helps um, you to look at certain limits within the bonding curve as such. So this is still new to me. I'm exploring as much as <laughs> I, I can at possibly at this stage. So hopefully when I have a better answer for you, um, I, I will definitely share that um, output with you. Thank you. So the last um, slide, which is going to be about uh, something which is actually called a liquidity contract, which is an accepted uh, market practice. Uh, it is also done by the issuer with a financial intermediary, which has a, they do have a bunch of, uh, you know, a certain um, sort of a liquidity pool, you can call it, that, and of course it is an intermediary in the, uh, you know, that, that is actually a centralized party, but they are regulated entities and they can uh, carry out the purchase and sale operations uh, to create or not create liquidity. Uh, but this relates to, so Mark has a question, it says, um, uh, what is Mark's what? question? Yeah, uh, thank you Vipin and actually, I I mean, I'm also in the same balancer research group. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to also um, second the, 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 the point on, on how balancer is not just looking at these asset managers, but also then what uh, dynamic weights and fee uh, right. functionality might better support uh, those liquidity pools. But actually, my question was going to be more around, I was just listening in on the... Um, Are you, are you still there? I, I don't seem to be able to hear you. What? So, Mark, perhaps you can talk. I was in just actually question. saying about the legally smart contracts and what auditing. Uh, we seem to have breaks uh, with you, Mark. Uh, you, your question doesn't come through. If you can type it in, uh, it, it may be uh, better because then we can actually see the question and answer them. Uh, but I, I believe what you're asking about is how closely do the smart contracts follow the actual human readable contract and if there are auditing mechanisms. Is that what you asked or are, are you there, still there? Anyway, I think uh, we have lost Mark or we have lost me, either either case. Um, yeah, sorry, can not, you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so sorry, I just put it, I put in the chat, but I was just saying that it was, it was about, yes, the, the ability to better mirror the smart contracts um, to the actual legal understanding in the, in the physical contracts as well as then having, and this is what it was discussed in this Frankfurt crypto asset discussion was state state mechanisms, or at least um, seen as trusted um, auditing and certification mechanisms that would yeah. also give better security um, to those participants in knowing that it was sort of given that certification and auditing, that it does meet those certain standards. And then also just in the design, um, just looking at what happened with uh, with LIBOR was sort of a, you know, yeah. no lawyer yeah. left behind because you had, you had the discontinuation of, of LIBOR and many contracts referring to LIBOR and actually in thinking around how taking that lessons learned and designing us legally smart contracts so that they could then be uh, more easily amended between the parties and having that flexi that sort of built in hmm. flexibility 
um, sort of a, a little bit aligning with the dispute resolution, but sort of in the amendment um, uh, provisions and clauses and how that could be well supported actually if properly designed. So those are my points, thank you. Certainly, uh, I, think, I think the uh, main point is that uh, the more we uh, cover in the initial contract, especially based on history, uh, the more secure we are uh, because there is always, uh, you know, that dispute resolution is baked into the contract. But of course, the emergent effects will never be able to be fully aware of. Uh, and we have to sort of be forward thinking about that um, by saying, you know, under what conditions is should people uh, redesign the, con the smart contract? I mean, I even, if, even in the case of uh, uh, events that have not been observed before, that that's a that's a tough, tough one. Yeah. And may I just add like one last comment before we- Yes, yes, the yes. Um, I think uh, we are amidst uh, an opportunity where it could be the best of both the worlds where enforceability of a contract legally, as well as execution of certain parameters on the specific contract through computation has to be a hybrid at a specific stage at this point in time, because while we explore that rabbit hole where we find that you know optimal balance and and um, inside the legal purview that's the reason why we are trying to take the project of um, ILS liquidity to FCA as well to get their you know um, their uh, view uh, and experiment this as well within their sandbox framework to understand you know some of the broader things that Mark also highlighted as a part of the conversation. So that's that's exactly what we are trying to do. Uh, while we say that we are not trying to boil the ocean, I think there's exactly a great opportunity to kind of explore hybrid models, which could possibly work as a, as probably a stepping stone in between them. Yeah, I mean, the, the point of this whole discussion was that these ideas are around, it, just concentrating on one level of the stack uh, is not, good enough. We need, uh, you know, the, the full thing. And it's not that, yes, it is boiling the ocean in a certain sense, but if you follow small accepted practices that are, you know, very limited in, uh, in uh, execution and principle, then you're safer than if you had not. Of course, uh, the end of the world uh, is nigh and you know you 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 cannot escape it but at least we are safer uh, that's all for today and hopefully this uh, sort of session was interesting to you guys and if so we are going to write a paper on or at least some thoughts on AMM following on from this. And uh, I hope to see you on another meeting soon. Thank you. And this is, of course, the references. Dan, are you still around uh, the East End? Uh, going back and forth right now in Brooklyn. Oh, okay. And you? East End. Looks pretty. Wisteria behind you. Well, that's uh, Central Park uh, in May 2020. I'm still thinking we have a garden filled with Wisteria. Looking. Well, that's nice. I love Wisteria. Yeah, beautiful. All right, guys. Um, it has been great. Please interact on uh, the mailing list. And we are also, of course, looking for uh, ideas for new talks. And uh, we'll continue the AMM discussion. Uh, 
Thanks. Thank you, Vipin. Thank you. And 